Karen Rasmussen's mother was divorced. Karen told me she was sure her mother was sleeping with the jewel tea man. She also told me that her mother told her she should get used to sleeping without underwear on. Susie Peterson's parents were never home. She had a million sisters and brothers, and they had a huge house that was run by the older kids. I remember seeing the first man land on the moon at Susie Peterson's house. We really didn't care that much about the man on the moon, but he probably didn't care about us either. Mary Linderholm's parents used to mark the liquor so that when they went out, they could tell if she'd drunk any. But Mary would drink some, and then she'd put water in the bottle up to the mark. Well, one day, Mary told me how upset she was about the attention that they gave to the neighbor girl. She was really sad. She cried. I didn't know what to say. Christine Pressure grew up on a farm. She first had sex in the cornfield when she was 14. She said it hurt. Her father had been having an affair with his secretary for years. And finally, when the youngest kid was almost done with high school, he divorced Christine's mother. She said her mother said that it made her whole body ache. Beth Harding lived in the perfect, happy church family. We all envied her. But years later, Beth told us that her father had had several affairs and that her mother's purpose on earth was to make her husband miserable. We should have guessed. Janice Berhagen's dad was the nicest guy you ever wanted to meet. He had six daughters, and they lived in a two-bedroom apartment in the same building as ours, a three-flat. I guess that's why I didn't think it was so strange my sister and I slept on the rollout couch of the living room. But you'd think that Jerry Verhagen would be mad as hell and drunk all the time with six kids to support on a tree trimmer's salary, but he wasn't. He'd come home, he'd play with them, he'd throw them up in the air, and they'd squeal. And my dad seemed pretty happy with the kids he had, too. But he didn't throw us up in the air. Well, he's blind, so that probably wouldn't have been a good idea. They said that the house we lived in was an old logging house. We were two blocks from Half Moon Lake, a man-made lake designed to bring the logs from the Chippewa River to the sawmill. But they closed up the entrance to the flume, and people swim there now. But our house was really weird. 
There was this door between our apartment and the Verhagen's that had been plastered shut. And Janice was my age, and we'd always try to open it or talk through it at night, and it never worked. My brother had his own room upstairs. When you got to the top of the stairs, there was the door to my brother's room and then two other doors that led to the upstairs apartment. But when I got older and my sister and brother left home, I had that bedroom. And I remember hearing for the first time the sound of love making through those doors. Oh it was kind of cool. <laughs> the Bedores had five boys and one girl. Diana was my age. She had a hearing problem and her brothers made fun of her. She was pretty smart in a way, but kind of dopey in another way. And Diana had to do a lot of housework. They had a great big house and a nice yard and a boat. But Diana's mom was kind of nutty, just like my mom. Just sort of off in space some of the time. Well, my mom didn't wake up one day when she was in the nut house, but Diana's mom hung herself in the basement when all but one of the kids had moved out. Maybe Mr. Badur made her do all the housework. Maybe he was having an affair. But what could make a woman so unhappy? Bobby Baxter lived next door. I think his father died when he was young. But they had a nice house, and he had an older brother. But Bobby always bugged me. I didn't trust him. Especially after being sent away to reform school for raping a girl one night. Right outside, across the street. I couldn't believe Mary Linderholm wanted to go behind the bushes with him. It was creepy. He called everybody ma'am, even the directory assistance lady. Nobody did that in Wisconsin. <laughs> Tony and her two brothers moved into our neighborhood when I was in the third grade, I guess. She had a mom and a dad, but I never remember them being home. If they were, they didn't care that we all slept over all the time. Tony was wilder than any of the other girls, and Diana's mother would never let her sleep over. Tony and Mary Anderson arranged for me to kiss my first boy when I was in fourth grade. He was in sixth grade and didn't go to my school. Fourth grade boys in my school were stupid. Anyway, they picked this boy because he wore desert boots, which I never understood. This whole setup really embarrassed me, but... When we finally actually kissed, it was really fun. But then one Saturday, when we were all over at Tony's, he called me up and told me that he never did like me. It just seemed so silly and so serious. In grade school, the boys hated the girls, and the girls hated the boys. The boys were always beating us up, and you'd fear for your life walking home from school alone. But then, when sixth grade came along, we were matchmaking and kissing in the bushes. Sissy Peterson was the most popular girl in our grade, and I think she started the whole thing. It seems to me our hormones were all sort of trained to follow the command of hers. It's the only explanation for us all changing our desires at the same time. Well, anyway, one would think that Susie would have wanted to kiss the most popular boy, Terry Eaton. But for some reason, she decided she'd rather kiss Mark Washburn. This was the boy who caused our teacher, Mr. Teeth, to give our class a cleanliness lesson. And Susie herself admitted that he had trouble wiping his nose. Well, anyway, I ended up delegated to kiss Terry Eaton. Being experienced, I really wanted to tell him that he had a thing or two to learn about kissing. But I could tell he had little desire to be engaged in this activity with me, much less take advice on the subject. I always desperately wanted to kiss Jeff Jackson. But he never wanted to kiss me. He wanted to kiss Laura Morris. He wanted to kiss her so badly that he asked her to marry him. I figured that Jeff wanted to get married so badly because his mom was always getting married. Five times. One time for only two weeks. But years later, I did kiss Jeff. I kissed him a lot the night before he went to prison for armed robbery. What a dope. So I asked Jeff why he did that, and he told me that he always wanted to have nice things. And I thought, well, Jeff, we all wanted nice things. None of us had any money, but he said he did so I don't know how he said candles. He'd be in the clothes, he'd be in everywhere he went. He was always trying to set up the candles or send these to him.
In 1919, wealthy Egyptian bee scientist Z.A. Abbasid arrives in England to promote international pacifism under the twin banners of artificial language and beekeeping. Abbasid meets Moses Spiralin, an experimenter in electromechanical radio vision, who urges Abbasid to investigate connections between radio vision, organic vision, and universal language. He also meets J.C. Maker, also known as Hive Maker, a bee farmer, importer of Dutch bees, jungle explorer, and Arctic cinematographer. In the Antarctic. Abbasid and Hive Maker set up a bee research farm. Abbasid raises rare Mesopotamian bees. He commissions Hive Maker to investigate bee language. Hive Maker instead builds a ghost cinematography machine. Abbasid does not agree with this line of research. When the two fight over funding, Hive Maker kills Abbasid. He then traps the release spirit in his machine. Abbasid grows to become an engineer specializing in military flight simulation systems. He is also a well-known amateur bee researcher, specializing in chemical communication. In 1983, Abbasid is called to a U.S. Army desert test facility to help investigate a UFO base discovered beneath the Carlsbad Caverns. The UFO base is inhabited by a self-sufficient colony of bees. Besides the worker, the drone, and the queen, the colony has a fourth type of bee with a flat imaging head, the television bee. Abbasid becomes involved with research surrounding samples and data brought back from the hive. He helps design a hive simulator to train researchers to enter the hive. One morning in the desert, Abbasid has an encounter with a hive UFO and discovers that the Carlsbad base is a dimensional window to Basra, Iraq. Abbasid does not tell the army of his discovery. Instead, he volunteers to become the first human to enter the Carlsbad hive. Transformed to bee size, he is helicoptered to the Carlsbad caverns. Abbasid enters the UFO cave. Cut off from the army, he finds the television bees, their heads glowing from pheromone molecules they digest with their honey. He transmits synthesizing image pheromones and feeding them back to the workers in the hope they will feed them to the television bees. The television bees quickly respond with images they could not possibly have, fragments from his life as another body. Abbasid discovers that the images are living ghosts and encounters his former murderer, Hive Maker. The encounter changes Abbasid into a Hive UFO. Now he has a need to kill. Rising through the dimensional doorway to Basra, Abbasid attacks an Iraqi tank and murders the crew. Unsatisfied, Abbasid then transmigrates in reverse, returning to Alamogordo in the year 1921 to inhabit an Apache fetus, who grows to become a genetic researcher specializing in maize.
Thank <laughs> you.